Oh, I was just going to say that some, you know, you, you, it, but some organizations were slower to pick up on that than others. I mean, if there's, through a number of the chapters uh, of, at your time at CBC, I mean, this, I, I mean, I, it's, I don't want to get too inside baseball, but if you, can, I, if you can imagine the idea that people would go on, talk about the news, but they weren't allowed to, to write the words or create the words that were coming out of their mouth. Well, I mean, you, would, you didn't have any control. I just, to me, that's fascinating. One of the challenges in the book, by the way, and I know I'm talking to a lot of people tonight who like books and, uh, and want to hear about how, to, how you write books and that kind of thing. Uh, one of the challenges for me in this book was to somehow answer all of those people who said to me over the years, why did you really leave the CBC? So I, I answer that question and I, I get to it in a very thorough way and about, I guess, two thirds of the way through the book. Uh, maybe halfway in. In a very gripping way. I mean, it's quite yeah. suspenseful. Well, it, it turned out to be a pretty dramatic event in my life. Yeah. But, uh, but what happened during that period, um, and, I, and I had to lead up to it, uh, when I joined the CBC, I was a CBC announcer. And as announcers, we did everything. The announcers were the front windows of the CBC in those days. And there were no women announcers, because even the CBC decided that women's voices weren't quite suitable for broadcasting in those years. So there were no women on the air. Women were on the air from time to time doing women's broadcasts. Um, and, you, you know, uh, Kate Aitken was I'd love one. to see Pamela Wallen's face yeah, if she were ever told that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but, uh, but that changed, of course, much later. But in any event, because I was an announcer, I could do everything in the early days. But then when television mushroomed, and uh, the unions came in and, and uh, the managers were striving to get control of this thing. The unions were wanting a piece of the action. And there were about four or five different union jurisdictions at the CBC, all of them, many of them overlapping. And if you were an announcer, you could read the news, but you couldn't have anything, anything else to do with the editorial process. No writing of the news, no editing of the news, no reporting into your newscast, none of that because the lines were very strictly delineated. However, if I uh, moved over one chair and, uh, uh, and were working for the current affairs department, I was able then to, to ad lib and do election broadcasts and that kind of thing. And the news editors understood that uh, you know, when you're doing an election broadcast, as an example, you can't wait for somebody to hand you a piece of paper because the information is right there in front of you on the computer. You'd better be dealing with it for the benefit of your audience right in front of you. So uh, they, they allowed that to happen. But when I walked into the newsroom, I could not uh, touch a typewriter in those days. Uh, I, I could not edit anything, and uh, legally I could have no part at all in what was going on. And I knew that the business was changing because those of us who've, who've survived a while in television know that the one thing you have to understand is that you have to be adaptable to the changing environment around you. So I knew that my time on the national would be limited unless I managed to make that leap. Well, uh, it was impossible at the CBC, uh, and I outlined some of that in uh, what, um, what Seamus says is, I hope, a dramatic way for you. And then um, CTV came along and said, uh, because, you know, it's a small business, they knew what was going on with me, and they said, come over here. Uh, you know, we are now an established national Canadian entity, too. Uh, you can do all of this over here. I really didn't want to go. I really didn't want to go. You'll see this in the book. But I knew that, and this was a, this was a really tough head and heart battle. But uh, in the end, I knew I had to make that decision. I made the decision. It was tough, and uh, fortunately, I didn't have to. Well, I looked back after being there about three months. I had a little, little quaver there, which you also, uh, you also find in the book. But, but um, you know, there, uh, I, I really knew that I had to make that decision. And having made it, uh, I was then able to grow as a broadcast journalist uh, and last, I think, a much longer period of time than I would have if I had stayed with Mother Corporation. Let's talk about another um, major decision for almost any anchor or television personality, and that's hair. <laughs> <laughs> hair is, hair uh, is very important. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. You well, have that chapter. I don't know whether I have that in front of us, uh, <laughs> Seamus, but it's, it's, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, as I'm trying to find it here, I'll talk to you about it because uh, it has to do with the time when 
when we um, moved my desk up off the floor to a riser, I guess really about maybe a little higher than this, off the studio floor. So that put me right under the top lights. Yeah. And uh, I was going gray at the time. This was in the early 90s. And um, my hair began to shine like the peaks of the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> so I had people saying to me, Lloyd, you better do something. You better do something. You know, you're looking, you're looking much older than you really are. So I didn't pay attention to it for a long time. Then I thought, OK, I'll give this a shot. So I went to my barber, hairstylist, as they call now. And, and he said, well, he says, well, I have a young woman here who does all this kind of thing. She'll look after that for you, no problem. I said, well, I don't want much. I just want to, you know, to take the shine off the gray. Is that possible? Oh, sure, no problem. So she dealt with me on a Saturday afternoon down at the Sheraton Center. And um, the next thing I knew, I had a full head of dark black hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know some of you here will be experienced in this kind of thing. Like, how do you get that out quickly? You can't. <laughs> so I showed up in the newsroom on Monday with this full head of dark black hair, everybody looking askance at me. <laughs> I love the reaction so, of, of Elaine Saunders, who's your makeup artist and who I know. And Elaine can, be, Elaine can be very frank, and Elaine just went, oh, Lloyd. Yes, oh, Lloyd, and then it trailed <laughs> off. Dot, dot, yeah, dot. Yeah, dot, dot, dot. Um, so I, 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 you know, people were saying to me, eh, eh, eh. Nobody, nobody really wanted to confront it. But I knew, right? So, so I went back to her uh, two or three days later, and I said, is there anything we can do? And she said, well, yeah, let's try something. Try. Well, oh, boy. Uh, it turned various shades of copper. Uh, it went, there were blue streaks in it for a while. Then blonde. And TV Guide had a wonderful line. They said, there is no sin, of course, in hitting the dye bottle, but uh, we wonder if Lloyd's having more fun now that he's a blonde. <laughs> <laughs> so it was finally this, uh, and I, I, I really was at my wit's end what to do, and, and I had this wonderful conversation with Craig Oliver, because Craig is, is quite the character, as you know, and he and I have been pals for a long time. And Craig... Uh, also, he didn't have to do it, but he was dyeing the fringe around his generally bald pate. <laughs> so Eric Morrison, who was the head of uh, Eric Morrison, that is not Keith. He was he was the head of news at CBC at, at CTV at the time, and he said, uh, "Craig, would you talk to Lloyd about about you know, his hair?" He says, "How the hell can I do that? I'm putting this stuff in myself." <laughs> but anyway, eventually we have this conversation, and and Craig says, "You know." Lloyd, it's really crazy. I mean, women have been dyeing their hair for ages and nobody gives a damn. Shouldn't it be the guy's turn now? <laughs> but, but as I say in the book, I guess it had to do, uh, especially in news, but I mean, here are these purveyors of truth, uh, the people who deal in the reality of life, and we all get old. And why are we trying to hold back the ocean in that respect? Uh, it just is not fair. So anyway, what happened was uh, Bruno Malfera, who is the uh, makeup room's hairdresser, he finally said to me, uh, Lloyd, I think I can fix your problem. He is a, a handsome Italian, and he speaks in a discreet. semi... Yes, discreet. And he speaks in a semi-conspiratorial tone all the time. <laughs> he's, he's Sicilian. And... Uh, <laughs> And he said, uh, Lloyd, I can fix your problem. So he, he had some magic formula that actually put gray back in the hair. And, and he just sort of, I, I don't know what he does. But, but anyway, there it was. And, and since it, then it, the, the fuss died away and it was all gone. But that was, the amazing thing about that, and this, this speaks to uh, the importance of cosmetics in television, and how cosmetics can rule television. Yeah. Because that caused such a fuss. Uh, people were writing about it. It was on blogs. And you know, I was hearing about it all the time. And of course, I'm in the middle of it thinking, oh my God, how am I going to deal with this thing? Uh, so I, I'm forever grateful to Bruno. And there's a chapter in here on this, which I think you'll really enjoy. Because it does speak to the importance, which we cannot deny, of cosmetics in television. In fact, Seamus, I think, had an interesting response when we were talking about this one time. And, and, uh, and his reaction 
when he first discovered that he had to put makeup on and have his hair done and all this kind of thing. It's something that I, I was used to by that time. But what happened with you? Well, I, I kind of considered it a little... I just, you know, everybody at you. And I, I just, in my... I thought, well, people should be listening to what I'm saying. Uh, what I quickly realized is if the, if the ties askew or if the hair's out of place or it's a weird color, they're not listening to a word you're saying. So you got to be... We, we have a producer who uh, we know very well, Sandra Fair. Hmm. And after my first year at Canada Am, I'd insisted on doing my hair myself, God help us all, um, and uh, didn't want very much makeup. Uh, but the hair was the big thing. And after a year, we changed our set, and Bev Thompson was my new co-host. And uh, Sandra came up to me and said, uh, Seamus, I want to tell you, 80% of television is lighting and hair. Yes. And then she said, the lighting's better. <laughs> dot dot dot. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and the I, next uh, day, Teresa was waiting with the hang, with the hair dryer. Couldn't uh, wait to get out my hair. I'll bet. Been I'll bet. Uh, as I'm uh, sitting at home now, watching the eleven o'clock news with uh, Nancy, uh, quite often the news will come up. Lisa will come up. The first line out of Nancy's mouth is, "I wonder who did her hair tonight." <laughs> And I said, I'm trying to hear the first line of the newscast. But that's it. You know, that's it. It's that power of that, that visual message that overtakes everything else. So we have had to, in television, get used to that yeah. and deal with it. And especially in news, because you, you don't want the cosmetics overpowering what you're, what you're reading and dealing with, because it's often quite serious. And um, so you, you have to, you know, I... I tried to find the right color combination that wouldn't have the ties dancing on the screen. Uh, I mean, look the at The woman Don. who would email you every day saying, yeah. what, what, what's with that puff? That's right. That's another part of the uh, <laughs> senior too. But there was a woman in Ontario who took it upon herself to make sure, make sure that my, uh, my pocket puff and my tie matched every night. And it was very many years ago that Arthur Weinthal, who was the vice president of entertainment programming for CTV, he said to me, and I wasn't doing it at the time, he said to me, Lloyd, put a, put a handkerchief in your pocket, a, a pocket puff, because it'll make you distinctive. Uh, I said, okay, so I tried that. But then, of course, you had to make it match with the tie, right? That's a challenge sometimes. So this woman in Ontario took it upon herself to write to me every single night. So finally, at, uh, after about four or five months of this, and I acknowledged it a few times, and thank you very much, uh, finally, after about four or five months of this, she said, I guess you're too busy uh, with the news uh, rather than having me bother you with this every night. But I have noticed that it's better than it was when I started. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a wonderful relationship with my mother when I was in Canada AM because if my tie was askew, I'd get an email from her saying, your tie's askew. And then I'd fix it, and she, after a commercial break, she'd e email me again and say, that's better. <laughs> We, we decided to cut the interview portion short because Lloyd wanted to give more people uh, time to ask questions. So uh, there's a mic there in the middle, and if, if anybody has any questions for Lloyd, we just ask you to use that mic right there in the middle of the floor. Sure. Uh, we, I have found in going across the country that um, uh, people seem to like the, the Q&A exchanges, the question answers. So uh, we just decided we'd, uh, we'd let that go on for a bit longer than normal. And there's the first questioner. Here, here. Oh, this is so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I love your hair and your poof. <laughs> 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 no, I'm embarrassed. Um, you mentioned your pipes. And uh, it always strikes me when, when uh, radio people come on board that in person it really is distinctive and I wondered if you had any tips for all of us about um, is this something you're born with is it something you can develop or what's your story around how you have such a distinctive voice well uh, thank you for the question ma'am uh, I have never had a voice lesson I wasn't even aware I had a great voice until someone began to tell me very early in my life and it was only then that I realized that uh, I had this equipment, and uh, I appeared in all the school plays playing the older guy. Uh, there's a picture of me in the book yeah. with a mustache and uh, white powder on my hair, 
Uh, I was the father in the Sunshine Twins in uh, 1951, I think it was, at Stratford Collegiate Vocational Institute. Uh, and I played the father role in, in a lot of those situations. I was in all of the debates. And when I discovered I had a good voice, I asked to be um, the, uh, the co-anchor, as it turned out, on the morning announcements over the public address system in, in public school. So uh, I, uh, once I became aware of it, and I don't know, I think I got kind of cheeky about it, actually. I think it made me a little pushier than, than I should have been. But, uh, but I began to realize that, uh, you know, this meant something to people. Uh, but what you discover very quickly when you get into broadcasting is that the voice may get you in the door. It did in the early days. It's much less important now because with the visual medium, of, of when television was added to the mix in the, in the 60s, uh, it became less important. But in radio, it was critical, especially at the CBC in the early days, to have at least a well-modulated, pleasant voice. Uh, but what you, what you discover very quickly is the voice will only get you started. Then you have to add everything else to that. Because, you know, if you're going into news broadcasting or sports broadcasting, you have to become a specialist in those areas. You have to know what you're talking about. You have to uh, be able to put context on the stories. You have to do interviews across the political and cultural spectrum. So you have to really, uh, the, the voice is always there and it can be uh, the centerpiece of your personality to some extent. But you've got to have a lot more than that on your bones uh, if you're going to move forward in broadcasting. Please. Um, listening to your news, I always wondered how much input do you actually have? Is it prepared by whole team? Do you review it before you read it? Can you veto something? Can you add it? How much input do you have yourself? Well, I was called a senior editor of the broadcast. Uh, and I, I was given the title of senior editor in 1984 when uh, Harvey left and I took over the solo role. And what that means, it mean, it's the same as the chief correspondent role, which uh, Peter Mansbridge has at the CBC, um, or the uh, chief editor. Some, in some cases, it's senior editor, chief editor, chief correspondent. And what that means is a huge amount of input. Uh, because it, 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 what it says is that uh, if I am going to front this newscast, if I'm going to be the person through whom all this information is conveyed, then uh, I have to have uh, a role in its preparation as well as in its presentation. So what it meant was that um, I participated uh, in the gathering of the information, in the editing of the information, in the writing of it, but always in conjunction with my colleagues. Because what you learn very early in television, and you would agree with this, Seamus, is that it's a team effort. It really is a team effort. Now, in my case, because I was there for so many years, uh, people just naturally kind of turned to me and said, what do you think, Lloyd, later anyway? But I knew when I was building this in, in, the, uh, in the early years that uh, you really had to take the talents of everybody on that desk, writer, producer, and make it work for the good of the broadcast. Because the only thing that finally matters is that the newscast comes out at the end of the night uh, looking credible, uh, looking complete. That is, you've covered the major stories of the day in the best way you know how. That's your job. And so if you're a good senior editor or chief correspondent, you're concerned about how the whole team is pulling together to get this done. But I never considered myself the court of last resort. That was really the job of the president of the division whoever that may be, and I worked under five different presidents in my time at CTV News, because if there's going to be a lawsuit about something, uh, you know, I'm not going to take on that ch challenge on my own. So, so obviously the president and I would have discussions sometimes about certain, certain parts, of, uh, parts of the stories during the evening. But um, uh, it really is a, a cooperative effort, and I think you have to understand that if you're on television, because you're relying on a lot of people. You're relying on, on, on the audio people. You're relying on the camera people. Uh, and they have to want to be able to work with you. They have to be able to want to make what a reporter has to, has to want to be able to 
do a good job on what's appearing on that show. So that's why it's important to, to, to be, try to be a good leader, to inspire, uh, and at the same time to be understanding of all of your colleagues, know what their challenges are as well as your own challenges.